This is a story about Robert Smalls, one of our great American heroes and the mother behind him. I want you to get a feeling for the mother that's behind the hero. The early life that Robert Smalls led and his Christian roots. His life during the Civil War. His life after the Civil War. A political career that he had that none of us ever would have imagined. His family and the honors and the legacy that he leaves behind. This was truly a great American hero. Lydia Polite was born at Ashdale Plantation on Ladies Island, South Carolina. This was a slave community owned by the McKee family. Lydia attended the Plantation Mission Church with her mother. At 10 years old, she was taken from the plantation to help raise the McKee's children. Mrs. McKee was drawn to Lydia the very first time she met her, and Lydia said to her, Hello, thank you for the orange. That so impressed Mrs. McKee that she immediately wanted to move her to the house to help with the children and be the house servant. She gave birth to Robert on April the 5th, 1839. Lydia and her son were both treated very well by the McKees. She was permitted to go every week back to the island to visit with her mother. She did no field work. She had plenty of food to eat, as did Robert. Her hand-me-down clothes were Mrs. McKee's hand-me-down clothes. She was definitely, for a typical slave, a well-dressed woman. The McKees supported the plantation mission. They encouraged the study of religion, and they also did not discourage the learning of reading, as most slaves were not permitted to learn. They were encouraged to attend the church and have that spiritual growth. When Lydia Polite was 43 years old, she gave birth to Robert Smalls in Buford, South Carolina, and he, along with his mother, were slaves of the Henry McKee family. Robert grew up as a slave. He lived with his mother in a small cabin behind the large McKee house. He was trusted by the McKees, however. He enjoyed more acceptance in the community than other slaves did. He stayed out with white companions after curfew. Henry McKee was a surrogate father figure and taught Robert to hunt, fish, swim, ride, and care for the horses. When Robert Smalls was but 12 years old, he became a bit mischievous, got himself into some trouble, and Lydia knew something had to be done. Lydia asked Mr. McKee to hire Robert out in Charleston. Robert was hired out as a day laborer, rigger, deckhand, sailor, and a pilot of the CSS planter. The planter was leased out to the Confederates during the Civil War. He settled down and met Hannah Jones, a slave from a neighboring plantation. She caught his eye. Robert went to Mr. McKee and asked if he could marry Hannah. Mr. McKee agreed, but Robert had to ask her owner. Hannah's owner agreed, however, Robert had to pay for her. In 1856, Hannah, at the age of 17, married Robert Smalls. During the Civil War, Robert was piloting the planter for the Confederacy. He was known for his ability of piloting through the Southern Rivers. However, his desire was for him and his family to be free. True to his belief, be free or die, Robert developed an escape plan to ensure that his family would be kept together and his wife and children would not be sold. 
He heard some of the Confederate men discussing a night out at the barn. The plan was on. This was his opportunity. The family was to meet up river near the river's edge. On the night of May 13, 1862, Robert, his mother, and his family went north on the planter. Robert wore the hat that the Confederate officer wore and knew all the secret signals, letting those at Fort Sumter know that all was good, thereby allowing him to go north. Then he was able to lower the Confederate flag and put up the white flag. He was free. Robert's desire was to escape, free his family, and ensure his wife and children would never be sold. When he turned the planter over to the Union, he also turned over a cargo of big guns and ammunition and delivered all the logbooks and Confederate codes to the Union Army. Robert's actions earned him a meeting with President Lincoln in the White House. Lincoln was so impressed with his courage and articulation of his actions, he decided to allow African Americans to fight in the Union Army. Robert Small's accomplishment on this venture makes me guess that if it weren't for Robert Small's, the Confederates might have won the Civil War and thereby continuing the practice of slavery. This is a picture of the planter, the ship that Robert Smalls piloted for both the Confederacy and the Union. Upon returning to Beaufort, South Carolina, Robert Smalls purchased at auction his childhood home. The McKees no longer owned the property. It was up for auction to pay property taxes, and the state was asking $700. Robert put in a bid of $650 and won the auction. He and his family moved in and began their life anew. Robert then became an entrepreneur and opened up a couple of stores. He and a few friends of his also had shares in a venture they began together. It was the first horse-drawn railway, and it was 18 miles long. But let's not forget his relationship with the McKees. They were close. They were like family. And when the McKees were homeless, the Smalls family moved them back into the house that they had owned all those years and that Robert and his mother grew up in. And the McKees lived the remainder of their life in that home with the Smalls family. Then. Smalls embarks on a political career. Even without a father, Lydia Polite raised her son to be a polite, caring man. However, it is strongly felt that Henry McKee is Robert's father. That would explain his interest in taking the young boy fishing and hunting. Robert had a devotion to Lydia and his family throughout his life. He married Hannah Jones in 1856, and they were married for 29 years. Hannah passed away in 1883. Robert and Hannah had three children, Elizabeth Lydia, who grew up to be a teacher, and followed her father to Washington, D.C., to assist him during his time in Congress. Robert, Jr., who at the very young age of two died of smallpox, and Sarah, who also became a teacher and was a very accomplished musician. Robert remained a widow for seven years. In 1890, he married Annie Wiggs. With that marriage, he gained two stepdaughters, Charlotte Jones and Clara Jones. He and Annie soon had a son, William Robert Smalls. Annie Wig died only five years after she married Robert. Robert's oldest daughter, Lizzie, lived to be 101. She passed away in 1959. 
as Robert Smalls goes into a political career, he goes from statesman to congressman. Robert Smalls began his political career during the time of Reconstruction. He founded the South Carolina Republican Party in 1867 and in 1868 attended the South Carolina Constitutional Convention, where they were to form a new state constitution that would be approved by the Federal Congress. That approval took 10 years. Mr. Smalls won election into the U.S. House of Representatives in 1875 and held that position until 1879. He did win his third term. However, he was almost immediately charged with accepting a bribe and lost his seat in Congress. We will discuss the trial in a moment. Suffice it to say, he claimed his position at the next election and fulfilled the 1882 through 1883 term for the South Carolina's 5th State District, despite South Carolina's gerrymandering the state to cut the success rate of blacks winning elections. In 1884, he won the election of South Carolina's 7th Congressional District and served through 1887. To sum up his political career, Robert Small served in the 44th, the 45th, the 47th, the 48th, and the 49th U.S. Congress. As you can see, this may have been the shortest trial in history. So let's see if I can condense this story as much as the trial was obviously condensed. On October 8, 1877, Smalls was arrested at his home with his family surrounding him. He had prepared his family of the upcoming arrest and assured them that he would not be convicted. The Honorable Judge J.Q. Marshall was presiding over the preliminary hearing. That same day, the South Carolina Attorney General called Josephus Woodruff to the stand, where he admitted that he paid Congressman Smalls $5,000 on January 19, 1873 to vote yes on a resolution that would award Woodruff a $350,000 contract to the Woodruff's Republican Printing Company. These words alone had the judge determine that there was sufficient evidence for an indictment. He did release Smalls on a $5,000 bond. Robert returned to Washington to be sworn into office. On October 22nd, he received word that the grand jury voted for indictment. He took a leave of absence from Congress and returned to South Carolina for the arraignment. The trial date was set for November 7, 1877, and Smalls was released on another $5,000 bond. During this time prior to the trial, Robert Smalls was approached by a South Carolina Republican, John Cochran, representing the Democrats, offering Smalls $5,000 to resign from Congress. The offer was declined. On November 7, 1877, the day the trial began, Robert Smalls' attorney asked for a change of venue to the federal court, also located in Richland County, South Carolina. The request was denied by the presiding judge the Honorable C.P. Townsend. First witness to the stand was Josephus Woodruff. Mr. Woodruff stated he gave Smalls a $5,000 check for a vote in favor of his company. Mr. Woodruff had already received immunity for his testimony. Robert Smalls was chairman of the printing committee and therefore had a great deal of influence. Woodruff again reiterated that he wrote and dated the check for January 19, 1873, and gave the check to the congressman. He stated under oath that Smalls accepted the check and deposited it into the South Carolina Bank and Trust Company on January 19, 1873. He presented no actual proof, only 
his testimony as read from his diary. Flaws in Mr. Woodruff's testimony were discovered when Robert Small's attorney, Samuel J. Melton, began his cross-examination. Number one, how could a check be deposited on January 19, 1873, a Sunday? No banks were open. Number two, Congressman Small does not have an account at the South Carolina Bank and Trust to enable him to make such a deposit. Number three, Woodruff testified that the check was made out to cash or bearer. Number four, the resolution he was supposedly paying Smalls to vote yes on had already been voted on in Washington, D.C. on December 16, 1872, and the congressman voted yes. Josephus Woodruff could not explain why it took him so long to pay the bribe money. Number five, all Woodruff's testimony was given by way of him reading from his diary. Attorney Milton objected to this being allowed. Mr. Woodruff presented no further evidence. Witness two was not much better. This was a Mr. Dealey, an employee of the bank. He produced a handwritten piece of paper dated January 18, 1873, stating the Honorable Robert Smalls deposited $5,000. There were no signatures on this handwritten note, and the bank could not produce a check. However, note that Zeely's testimony stated the check was deposited on January 18, and Mr. Woodruff's testimony stated it was deposited on the 19th. On November 10, 1877, the case went to the jury. After the trial and before sentencing, Robert Smalls was approached again by a Mr. Drayton, a newspaper editor from Aiken, South Carolina. Mr. Drayton offered Smalls $10,000 to resign from Congress, and states, Wade Hampton will leave you alone. Who was Mr. Hampton? Why, he just won the November 7, 1877 election for governor of South Carolina. Neither he nor Mr. Drayton were ever prosecuted for bribery. The verdict came in, three years with hard labor in the state penitentiary. Robert Smalls was sent to the city jail and released on bond three days later, pending appeal of the state Supreme Court. Surprise, he lost that appeal. But it was then accepted by the U.S. Supreme Court. Before the case made it to the U.S. Supreme Court, President Hayes made a deal with still Governor Hampton, who was now running for the U.S. Senate. And the deal was to pardon Smalls, Cardosa, and Carpenter. In doing so, they would avoid prosecution of South Carolina's Democrats for corruption and violence related to the Hamburg Massacre. Governor Wade Hampton won his U.S. Senate election. In the end, Robert Smalls continued his political career, and the new governor of South Carolina, Governor Simpson, granted full pardons to two of the men the president demanded must receive full pardons. That was Smalls and Cardoza. Carpenter was previously pardoned by Governor Hampton. All three of these men, Smalls, Cardoza, and Carpenter, had similar experiences. Lydia Polite died in 1878 at the age of 82 shortly after the conviction of her son. Robert Smalls died on February 23, 1915, at the age of 75, from malaria and complications of diabetes. The family burial plot is located at the Tabernacle Baptist Church in Beaufort, South Carolina, the church the Smalls family had always worshipped at. At the front of the church is a bust of Robert Smalls.
The love of their church and faith took the Smalls family through the hard times of slavery and the South's disdain of slaves being free. The strength that their faith and trust in God gave them helped them maneuver those times while still showing kindness to all people and never seeking revenge. The McKees and other plantation owners felt it was important to bring Christian religion to their slaves. The thought was that if slaves had a bit of religion, they would be more satisfied and better workers. Lydia was active and diligent in her religious studies and instilled the same strong Christian foundation in her son, Robert. She was worried that Robert never felt like a slave and was too proud of his actions. She feared he would get into trouble by not realizing his position as a slave. Lydia took him to witness slave auctions and to the public whippings of other slaves to instill in him the gravity of his status as a slave. She taught her child, as did other slaves, that in God's eyes they were all God's children and therefore as good as anyone else. The plantation owner's belief in seeing Christianity taught to their slaves to keep them pacified were the same teachings that taught the slaves to lift their arms up to the Lord, to save them and show his grace upon them. We will finish this story with Genesis 50, 20. You intended to harm me, but God intended it for good to accomplish what is now being done, the saving of many lives. I would like to quote Robert Smalls in a speech at the Constitutional Convention in 1895. My race needs no special defense, for the past history of them in this country proves them to be equal to any people anywhere. All they need is the equal chance in the battle of life.